Hey guys, it's Tony at COPO, and it's been a while since I recorded a tutorial since I've been really busy, so I'm sorry about that, but I've got time for a quick, easy tip for you, and hopefully soon I can post another in-depth, advanced tutorial, but for now, I just want to share this great little trick I stumbled on, and I never really knew I could do this until now, so I wanted to share it with you guys, in case you don't know about it. But before I get started, I just want to address one thing. There's this amazing community on Vimeo and YouTube with tons of videos and tutorials teaching us all great tricks, and they're all totally free. And a lot of us on here are doing these in our spare time because we're genuinely excited to learn something and teach it with others who might not know about it. However, I'm having an issue with a few people on YouTube who have been stealing other people's videos and posting them on their own monetized channels. That means they're making money off of our hard work that we put a lot of time and effort into planning, solving, and recording these projects for free for the community. So what I'm asking you guys is if you're searching for a tutorial and you notice from the logo or the watermark or the website, Twitter, or even if the person in the tutorial identifies themselves by name, if you notice you aren't watching that video on the original author's channel, do me a favor and just stop watching and seek out the original source. It's the least you can do for a free lesson. That's all I'm asking, okay? But for the rest of you guys, I can't thank you enough for the amazing support and the awesome feedback from everyone. It's so cool to come onto these channels and read all the comments and then get on the soapbox and bitch and moan and whine about everything. So let's stop with the yapping and let's get into the tutorial. So let's switch over to our editor and I'm going to create a sphere and I'm going to look at my lines here. Now this is something that we've all done a million times and I'm just going to show you real quick. If you go to the MoGraph cloner and you drop the sphere into the cloner and then you change the cloner to a grid and you spread the grid apart like this. You can, with the cloner selected, go under MoGraph Effector and apply a random effector. Now you can go to the parameters of that random effector and then you can randomly say wherever each one of those clones were generated, randomly put them in a different dimension from the original zero, zero position that you were born in randomly up to the limit of this number that I'm giving you. And the same goes with rotation. For every, every instance that is um, cloned, if I put in a value of 360 degrees, that means each, that random effector is going to take each clone and it's going to create it in, in, a, in a random direction. What happens though when I hit play on the playhead is this all just stands still and nothing happens at all. So if you go under the effector and you change it from random to uh, noise, now that these random parameters are being animated. So each one of these cloned spheres in this grid are being spun around uh, and displaced um, by these parameters in this nice animated fashion. So if I turn off rotation, then you can see that none of them are being rotated. Okay, so here's, this is, this is how we all know and use um, these effectors because we have these MoGraph objects, cloners, matrix, fractures, MoTeX, all of these things that have these effectors. If I tear this off here, each one of these each one of these MoGraph objects can be influenced by one of these MoGraph effectors, and that's what we're all typically used to, to doing. But check this freaking stuff out. This is what I just found out. So if I take this sphere out of the cloner, I get rid of the MoGraph object altogether. All I have in my scene now is a sphere. I want to take this random effector, and I want to drop it as a child of the sphere. If I hit play, though, nothing happens at all. And that's because if you go under the deformer tab and you change it, the deformation by default that's off, you set it to point. Now it's gonna deform, randomly deform every point on that sphere and now if I hit play, look what's happening. That's pretty cool. So now, what we wanna do though, because I was messing with the parameters in here, I wanna set these to zero in the X and zero in the Y and I only want it to move in the z-axis. So if I hit play, now you see I'm getting this really cool like liquid bubbly thing going on here. Other things you can do under the effector tab is you can actually change the animation speed and we can slow this down to like this really viscous blobby shape happening here. I can even change the scale of this down from 100 to 50. I can get a uh, real harsh um, movement happening in here. Now what I can do now is smooth this out. I could take my sphere and put it in a hypernerve. And 
Now that smooths it out, and I can turn off my lines here, and you can see if I take the hypernerve and I match the editor to the renderer, so we'll subdivide three times. I'm getting this weird shape up here, and I always had this problem. I did this in the balloon tutorial, if you remember. I'm going to turn off the random effector for a second and the hypernerb. Go back to our lines. Turn off the hypernerb here. In our line mode, we've got this polar coordinate system with latitude and longitude lines on the, on the sphere. I'm just going to override that by changing the object from standard to icosahedron. And that's going to give us this um, triangular shape all the way around with no polar points on there. So now when I create the random effector and turn on the hypernerb, turn off my lines, now you can see that weird shape is gone. And if I hit play, we get this really cool, great shape thing going on here. So there you go. You can use the random effector on objects as a child of an object instead of uh, an effector on a MoGraph object. I thought that was really cool. That's it for the tutorial. But you know what? Let's spice this up a little bit. Let's make this kind of fun and cool. Um, I'm going to hit stop for now. And I, I want to create a material to put on the glob. So I'm going to double click my material. Let's turn on our um, interactive render region because I like to show you guys what I'm doing while I build my materials. First thing I want to do is I want to add reflection to this. And oh, you know what? We have to put the material on to the hypernerb here. And now what's happening is it's 100% reflective. So it's reflecting all the blackness around because there's no lights and there's no. Um, objects in the scene to reflect off of it. So what we want to do is put a, an object to reflect off there. So the best way to do that is just create a sky dome over the entire scene. Let's go to our content browser and in our HDRs, um, I'm just going to grab this one. It could be any HDR image. It doesn't even have to be the one I'm using in this tutorial because this is just a tip. So let's just go back to our viewport. Now what you can see, here let's hide this is this shape has a 100% reflective material on it and it's reflecting the sky dome. So if I um, let's move this back into the center and if I rotate the scene around, there's a, um, an HDR map applied to the sphere so I can spin around the scene and it looks like uh, the world is around us. So if I settle on a point here, kind of level off my horizon, you can see that this shape is reflecting the scene around us, right? So what I want to do is, let's put this back off to the side again. I don't want to see this background, I just want to see the reflection in here. So with the sky selected, I can just add a Cinema 4D tag of compositing, and I can tell that tag, I can turn off scene by camera, so when it renders, we, it's still affecting the reflections because everything else is still selected here but it's not being rendered. So that gives us this reflection. So now let's go back to our um, material. And from all the other tutorials you've watched, you know that you should put a Fresnel mask on to your reflection. So there are hundreds of tutorials out there that explain what Fresnel does. Uh, basically, it just means that uh, when the photons are facing straight at the camera, be affected by one color and when they're 90 degrees away from the camera be affected by the other. In this instance we use it as a mask that says black will mask out what's facing directly at the camera and white will reveal what's facing away from the camera. This is a, a hundred percent influence right now so we can slide this down to zero to turn it off and basically you're seeing it's allowing this value, the brightness of a hundred percent of the reflection to show on the object. So we could bring that to about 80 or so. Now that's 80% full reflection. So as I slowly introduce the Fresnel back in to like 50%, it's basically saying take this 100% invisible, 100% visible, bring it down to 50%, but let 80% of this brightness show through. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. There are millions of other explanations of Fresnel, but that's what we're doing here. The next thing I want to do, I want to set up a little background in my. Um, in my scene here. Um, but I'm just going to do quick and easy. I'm going to set up a background, uh, a background environment here. And what that allows me to do is create a new texture. And I can apply this texture onto that background. 
And in the luminance, I'm going to turn off all these settings. I'm only going to turn on luminance and I'm going to create a gradient. And that means regardless of how the camera moves, that gradient is always going to be pinned to the frame of my camera, no matter how I change the uh, angle of the camera. So what that does is it allows you to cheat these really cool backgrounds. I can do a 2D circular pattern. I'm going to invert the knots. So we kind of get a nice vignette happening around the edge here. So I can see I can spin the camera any way I want, and I still have this vignette happening around here. So what we want to do is go into that gradient. I'm going to set the, the white part, the middle, to kind of a blue, kind of a muted blue color, something like that. And then I want the, the edge to be a darker blue, something like that. So now what we can do is go back to our reflected material that's on the sphere. And in the color channel, I'm just going to kind of colorize that to look somewhat similar to that background. Pretty cool. And we can hit render real quick and you can see what's happening is the anti-aliasing is only affecting the outer edge of the object and not the reflections and the textures inside. So you go to your render settings and you go to anti-alias and you change it from geometry to best. Now I think this gets overridden when you go into the physical renderer. That doesn't even matter. But in the standard renderer, you go from, from geometry to best. And then you can knock that level from 4x4 four four down to 2x2 two two for a quicker render. And we're going to animate this. So we're going to set it from still image to Gaussian uh, animation. Now if I hit render, you can see it's a little bit softer in here. And that just keeps it from flickering when you're animating it. Now this is also helpful because the next thing I want to do is there's a cool shader in here. If we go to the bump channel and I go down to surfaces and add water. Water is cool because if you right click and animate, you can see that bump map is actually animated like water. So you click in here and you can change the wind from like one to something like, I don't know, three. And it'll go really turbulent and really fast and violent. I don't know if that's going to be too much, but who cares? And now you can see we got this really cool bumpy mess going on here. And if I want, I could even maybe crank up the bump. That might be too extreme. Keep it 20, 25-ish. And then I could even come into the texture tag here, and I can change the scale of the bump if I want larger. Just go 250 by 250. And that'll give me larger scale on here. And that's all there is to it. So let's um, do a quick little render while I'm talking this um, tutorial out and see what we come up with. So we go to our render settings, go to output, and we want to change this to all frames. I'm keeping it small for the screencast here and we hit render and if you hit control tab you get full screen so we can sit here and watch this and you can see the water bump map is actually animating on top of this liquid shape so we're getting like a fake motion inside of a real motion in here and it gives you just a really cool fun quick effect come down here and we can hit the uh, play while it's rendering still, and we can let this finish out while, um, while I talk out the rest of the tutorial. So just a nice quick tip here that you can use the random effector not only on MoGraph objects like we all know and use daily, but you can also apply it directly to a primitive shape. And notice I didn't even convert the sphere to a polygon. It's still a, a primitive editable mesh. So um, this is a really, really super handy quick tip. And again, thank you for listening to the preaching soapbox on the beginning of the tutorial. I really appreciate everybody who comes by and shares uh, comments and tips and tricks and um, just all around positive feedback. So I want to continue doing these. And, um, and I think it's important to encourage everybody to support the original authors of all of the videos to make us uh, want to continue to create content for you guys for free. So 
Uh, thanks again, and uh, next time uh, we'll try to uh, have a more in-depth tutorial for everybody. Until then, uh, we'll see you guys soon. Bye.